into uh, what we're now calling Deep Dive. Uh, and uh, this is Ask the Masters. Um, I'm Dave from Fluid Dynamics, uh, and we got a really, really cool project today. I actually have not seen this presentation. Rick has done it a number of times, uh, but the pool that you see on the screen is going to be amazing. And uh, this is Rick with Red Rock Contractors and also with Ask the Masters. And we've also got, just so everybody knows, we got Art Minty. He is one of the, uh, well, Art, actually put your speaker on and just introduce yourself before we uh, get moving. Hey, hello. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Dave and Jason for having us all on today. I'm Art Minty. I'm the Senior Director of Technical Services with Lady Creek International. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, learning exactly what Rick did here with this build. It looks great. So, and Jason, if you want to introduce yourself, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm Jason Jovag with uh, Quarter Glazing International. Uh, we do underwater pool windows. Uh, we supplied and installed the three viewing panels that are shown on the project here with Rick. Uh, look forward to talking to you guys about the windows and how that interfaces with the pool structure as well as the waterproofing systems. The whole point of this whole time is for uh, for us to walk you through step by step from the design process all the way through construction and to really give everybody kind of a thorough understanding of some of these really highly complex projects and, and some of the challenges. And, and the goal is to, uh, to better all of us. Um, like I said earlier, I'm very much looking forward to this. I have not seen this presentation myself. And so I'm, I'm here uh, as a participant as well to learn. So um, go ahead and take it away, Rick. In pitching. Then you come in with the, the waterproofing membrane. So in this case, as you mentioned, it's the third, the third barrier now, right? Yep. So this is an ANSI 11810 compliant waterproofing, also doubles as an ANSI 11812 crack isolation membrane. So it's a dual function membrane. Um, it's compatible with the leveling, compatible with the tile adhesive. It's flexible. So if you get a little bit of deflection, it can handle up to typically an eighth of an inch lateral movement. Um, and it's ideal for these types of applications where you're looking for that extra layer of protection. So you already did a lot of upfront waterproofing with the integral mix and then also your colloidal silicate. But now this is, is stopping anything from getting down even into that layer. Right. Um, Let me interrupt you, Art, real quick. Um, sure, go ahead, Dave. Because uh, I heard you say something, um, and I want you to expound on it a little bit more. Uh, you you said a number of times, compatible, compatible, compatible. So uh, get into that. What does that mean? And and uh, you know, it's 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 thin set and it's waterproofing, and and uh, can't we just kind of mix and match? Uh, explain that from your perspective. Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I didn't mean to tee you up that way, but it was good. Good, good segue in. Rick alluded to it before when he showed us the picture of the pocket where they put the acrylic uh, glass panel in and they used a, an epoxy type membrane. Um, if that sand broadcast wasn't there, that would create a lot of problems for compatibility reasons. When we say compatible, um, what we try to say, and we don't care if it's our system or not, but try to use a suite of products for the installation that's from a single manufacturer. Uh, we can ensure compatibility from top to bottom. Um, the warranties remain intact. And when you're mix and matching, you kind of get manufacturers that may not know the lines completely. Totally out of an innocent perspective. Um, but if you use one manufacturer's products, they can tell you exactly what is needed, cure times, sequencing, layering how to integrate into uh, different uh, panels, pipe penetrations, drains, on and on and on. So the compatibility part is important, especially on a job like this. Think about the risk that, that is carried on a project like this if there's a problem with leaking or, or cracking or whatever, you know, tile debonding, things of that nature. Um, there is a lot of place to check for compatibility is an easy process. And again, what we always say, stick with one manufacturer, use the single source type of uh, outlook on that. Yeah, and, and we do the yeah. same thing. And we're, we're, we're trying to be as critical as we can to use a system from one manufacturer to another when we can. Um, and, and maintain that priority. We can't always, because there's once in a while we run into a product that doesn't, you know, we're dealing with a Dow epoxy or something. What, Jason, I don't know what epoxy you're using usually, but whatever that epoxy we're using is not something supplied by um, 
in this case, Laticrete, so or Laticrete. So we got to then make sure we find a way to make them compatible. But usually we're dealing with materials that, that they're aware of what they are or their, or their makeup is similar. And so we can find a way to make them compatible. But you're in a, in a project where you have extreme liability, meaning when this fails, it could cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars, not, oh, hey, a piece of tile popped off. Um, if we have failure here, it's very, very expensive. And if we have a mixture of materials and mixture of, of non-compatible, potentially non-compatible materials, obviously the, the, the fingers are all going to get pointed on the install and the, and the construction side of it, not maybe manufacturer. And, and often we find even where, there's, where, where we think it's manufacturing defect, more importantly, it's typically a defect of the install of that product because they didn't follow temperature restrictions or mixed time restrictions or any of those things. And so when you get into this level of project, and that's what I think Dave is starting and Art started to allude to is there's not room for error to say, well, it doesn't matter if it's 110 and the water is super hot and we're not paying attention to temperatures. You notice we're tented. You notice that we're, we, we check mixed water temperature. We check our surface temperatures. We make sure they conform. We're in, we're in Arizona. We work in an environment where we have to make accommodations for shot creek processes. We have to make accommodations for tile applications all the time. It's 110 right now. I'm wrapping a tile in black porcelain in, in, in Northeast Scottsdale. As we speak, it's all under shade. It's all conditions. It, it's all evaporative conditioned at some level. And we're providing them mixed, you know, a 55 gallon drum with a garden hose full of ice in it, giving us nice cool water to work with. All those things come into play. If you come in and don't follow those rules, you'll have failures and you'll have no re recourse to come back for problems. So um, it's critical that you do that. And it's a good point to make, Dave. Yeah, and, and just to, to press into it just a tiny bit more, um, Art, can you just talk about, I, I, I hear this so often that people are scared to call the manufacturer because they feel like you're coming out there and you're going to catch them in the one little thing. Uh, and, and that's really not your heart. Uh, you know, everybody, every manufacturer's rep that I have talked to, they want you to succeed because, uh, you know, like we keep talking about, the liability on a project like this is huge and nobody wants to end up in court and and everybody ends up getting pulled in and so uh just just kind of reiterate that 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 from a manufacturer's sure. perspective your job is not to catch us in something bad your job is to help us be successful yeah that that that's a great point Dave. We're, we're not the tile police we we love when we get upfront calls you know from from a manu manufacturer's perspective the specification and detail work is what we enjoy. We love to be involved ahead of time. Um, we we obviously with the, the COVID-19, you know, accessibility to sites is a little restricted now, but we love to come to job sites. And, and I'm sure I'm not speaking just for, for our company. I think all manufacturers in our business would, would want this. We'd rather have that 10, 15 minute conversation ahead of time rather than trying to troubleshoot after the fact, right? And then all of us in the industry, we, we love to see projects like this, even if it goes to a competitor from, from our perspective, that means that successful tile installations are being done. That means the demand for that increases when people see these projects like this and they see them, you know, on magazines or on the web or, you know, through social media, people say, I want this, that, that end demand of tile consumption benefits all of us in the industry. And that's what we're all striving for. Successful installations, drive demand for tile finishes, and we're all happy. So we'd rather have that conversation up front. We, we, we don't shun anyone from calling us ahead of time. Absolutely. Don't, and every rep, whether it's mechanical reps or tile installers or acrylics, that, that's the point we're making is, look, me and Dave do some really complicated jobs, but the reason we do those complicated jobs with success is because we bring a team together. I, you know, I work on projects with Dave. Dave works on projects with me. We're pool builders. We're what competitors technically in the field. We have continually worked to help each other in different projects. Um, and, and I do that for other pool builders. And so does he, this is when you get into projects like this, there's a lot of team players in order to pull it off. And if, if you, if you want to be arrogant and think you can do it yourself, you're going to fail quickly. Um, we're, we're, we, we are open to help all the time. We get with our shotcrete guys that have more shotcrete experience than us and talk through how should we shoot this? What's the best method? What, this is what I was thinking. What do you think? We find holes in each one of our ideas and come up with the best solution. Um, same thing here. This is, this is an effort that brought everybody to the table. So we get a final product that works out well for everybody and we don't have failure issues. So 
Um, make sure make sure you bring the team together. They're always willing to to help. They always want to be involved. They the last they'd rather help you early and walk you through it and spend all that effort to do that than be sucked into a problem and then trying to figure out why it's failing and try to solve a solution. So. Um, as we move on, one of the things I circled in here to actually add a little ex, uh, more da or problems to the tile install is every one of those little, blue, build, little pieces of blue tape or a fiber optic point of light. So we had a massive amount of, we actually started off with about a thousand points of light in this pool, but you're gonna lose 40 to 70% of them in a tile job because we got them, they have to come up in the grout line randomly, right? We can't make that happen. We're gonna put them all in place and then work around them. And so there's a bunch in the pool, it looks great at night, but it was just added to the, the issue of being doing the tile work and, and peeling those back up through our, through our tile and paper faced material. So um, I think somebody asked this question, so I'm gonna bring it up in the process. So this is an all paper faced tile product. We, we, we do everything possible. We, we certainly have installed some mesh mounted materials in swimming pools. I'm not gonna pretend like we don't. Um, in an all water, in a waterproof condition that's crazy, in an all glass tile pool, we absolutely would only use a paper faced material. Listen, nothing wants to stick to glass very well, no matter what we're using. And the last thing we wanna do is have any piece of material that could cause compromise to the, to the uh, integrity of the install. And so they make plenty of mesh faced glass. We've used some of that on water lines in some small occasions, but when you get into these kind of considerations in this client level, if you wanna meet the TACNA standards, get your 95% of thin set on back of tile, that's near impossible to do with anything. And, 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 even, and even if you're gonna use mesh mount material, you gotta pro test it prolific, prolifically. I've seen material that says for swimming pools, says for spas, we check it, throw it in a glass of water and it's a water soluble glue that covers 100% of the back of the tile. Um, the extreme failure is in your future if you're doing that. So just, I, I'm not gonna harp on mesh, not mesh, but in this scenario, when you're at these kind of levels of clients, I would always recommend that you do everything possible to meet all the standards you can and maximize your success. So in this scenario, it's a paper face product, absolutely nothing on the back of the tile, ideally getting 100% of um, coverage on the thin set for the tile. So. Um, this is just showing, we, we use a jet system that has a protrusion past the face of the wall. And so we've recessed all our, jo our jets and we kind of bend our tile in there and just show some of the detail level of, of uh, what, good, what good quality tile guys can, can pull off in a swimming pool. Um, just some starting to get some finish and parting shots. You can see uh, this is, we've got this gutter system in here, right? This is our little lot in our gutter that, uh, that ties the pool to the spot, allows those levels to stay the same. Um, we've got a, we got our benches pushed into the pool enough to give us a nice little neck roll and helped us create a, a tough Lautner detail at the back of a bench, but allowed us not to have, um, you know, the benches right up against the deck. So you can see our finished tile work. You can see they've actually got mister systems and these little snakes and they got mister, you know, these little snakes here are misters and they got a whole row of misters and inside our finished deck. Um, we've got little clean outs. You can see one in the, in the center here. That's a clean out to our gutter system in case pool toy, water noodle, towel, something gets stuffed into that gutter, we've got some access points because there's really no way to get to any of that plumbing um, without tearing into a ceiling of a finished project. Uh, as we start filling our pool, um, good view of the acrylic. You can see one of the things we did, we also ran a, a band of tile that matches the outside tile on the inside of our acrylic panels. One of, the, one of the things is if you look inside the panel, you're gonna see that finished edge and using a larger format material helps us create a nice clean edge for Jason to caulk to. Um, and it blends right in. You don't really notice it when the pool's full, but it gives a nice clean line and break point instead of a bunch of little tiny faceted tiles that we need to silicone or caulk to. So we chose to bring that inside the pool just slightly and help create a nice finished rebate for Jason. And there's some, these are, I got some pro shots when we're done as well, but here gives you an image. There's our water line right on top of the tile or right at the deck level. Um, you can see brilliant, good tile. Everything looks good inside. Um, here's kind of a view from the outside. You can see in, this is the beauty of acrylic, right? We can see into it like we're wearing a pair of goggles. One of the things to remember, if you do acrylic panels, I usually don't recommend view panels that can see into a pool when we're dealing with plaster or hand trial type finishes because they, they show every single defect magnified. So you gotta be really careful. Um, if you've got a typical shot creek pool and plaster pool and you wanna do an acrylic panel, realize that put a, if you have a pool or you, or you get in pools enough because you're in the industry, throw some goggles on, go look down and look closely. You're gonna see all those detailed defects. And so be very careful when you can see into the pool 
because you're going to realize that any defect has now been magnified. So it's, it, it's important to recognize how you're going to use the panels. I like being able to see through the panel. I think that's more important to see into the pool than to see out. Um, and I'm actually going to show you the next picture to explain to people what the final expectation is. Most people assume when we put acrylic panels on the outside of a pool, we're going to look right through them like there's nothing there. If you'll notice in this image, which isn't doctored in any way, what does it look like that acrylic panel is? It apparently looks like it's glass tile off the floor because the floor is, because of the refraction of the water and the refraction of the panel, depending on what angle you're at, but majority of angles at a distance from the pool, all you see is the pool floor on the acrylic panel. You don't see directly through it. Now at night and backlighting and stuff can change a lot of that, but if a client's expectations are, it's gonna be like a cube of clear liquid out there that they can see down a cliff, for instance, or see out to the ocean through the panel, this image is a perfect explanation of why that does not happen, right? Majority of the time, especially at daylight, I think Jason will explain, if it's night and it's lit from behind, you'll see through the panel much better. But very often what we get is a reflection of the pool floor. And you notice it stops right at the water line. So it's the refraction, the effort of the water in the pool and the, the acrylic itself that causes that reflection. So it almost looks like it's a concrete wall covered in tile when you look at it close. So just be, a, be cognizant of that. Jason, you got any more pointers on that piece? It's, it's mostly me making sure the client's expectations are met because you got them spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on a piece of acrylic and they go, well, it looks like my wall. Yes, it does. <laughs> Yeah, based based on this photo, yeah. I mean, some yeah. of the radius pieces and stuff, you you will get that mirrored image back. Um, so it does kind of take away from it a little bit. But, um, you know, the ambient lighting, whether it's a, a horizontal window or, you know, your view there that you're showing on screen, I mean, obviously it's, it's optically clear. Um, but yeah, from the water side looking down, you will see that light refraction back, uh, you know, from the wet side. Absolutely. So just be aware that it, again, it's, it's not, it's not going to kill a job, but don't get it, get the expectation that you can create this cube that doesn't exist. Um, and, and there's infinite depth to it. You'll see and reflect off that. This, this is where I like to see acrylic used the best where you can see back into the pool. Cause it's a dramatic look from every level. Um, and it's really cool. You also want to be careful. I don't in, in commercial settings where there's a lot of water quality issues, you got to be very conscious because again, it shows everything very well. And so clarity is important. Um, you know, you really want to manage your water clarity and your chemicals and everything to be very cautious. One of the things somebody brought up earlier, Jason, which we should chat about is talk about maintenance of acrylic in a swimming pool and what kind of issues you have to deal with and, and how to maintain them so you don't ruin them. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, we, when we close out a document, we'll, a project, we'll give you guys a, a, your first initial cleaning kit and materials that need to be used on the windows. So we don't want to use any Windex, any ammonia-based cleaners or anything like that on the material. It will start to break it down over time. Um, so there's a lot of different acrylic safe materials out there that you can use. Um, maintenance wise, most of the stuff that we see from a damage standpoint is usually caused by uh, the maintenance company that's out there, whether it's, you know, using a pool brush on the window. I mean, that's typically most thing, you know, we'll get somebody out there that hasn't worked on the, on the project before, not familiar with the material, hadn't seen it. And, you know, they'll take a steel brush to it and uh, not, now we got it scratched. So, um, you know, when we engineer the panels, there is a little bit of thickness. Um, over for serviceability and, and longevity of the panel. So it can be sanded and polished. Um, it is a, a, a rather expensive process to get done. It does take some time. Um, and you know, a lot of the times it's gonna require dewatering the pool. Um, but I mean, it, depending on the scenario, it can be done underwater. Um, but yeah, just asking the right questions, giving you the right product in the beginning will, will take a lot of the guesswork out and uh, hopefully minimize the damage. So I think, and, and part of that is just one of the things with maintaining these panels, water line, like this pool has, has a water line issue, right? We get buildup of water line on everything. Um, acrylic's fairly uh, slippery, so things don't like to stick to it. But if you give it enough time, it will definitely give you more problems. So continuous maintenance is more important. It's not something you want, like a water line on a, on a porcelain tile pool, you can come back three years later and hit it with a sandblaster. When we've got acrylic pools, you got to be more, more cognizant of maintaining that more regularly. So it's an easy process. And, and to Jason's point, use some really careful considerations on what product you're using and make sure you don't have a, you shouldn't even have a pool brush near this pool. That's, you know, there's pool brushes that have stainless steel, um, brushes in it. You absolutely don't want that even anywhere near this house because somebody, some kid, somebody will start brushing that panel down and scratch the living crap out of it. And then we're draining it. And Jason comes out, sand, polish, and spend a week out there making your window pretty again. Um, another guy is asking, do we have any, any situations where salt water causes problems with acrylic panels in any way, Jason? Um, no, I mean, it's, it's the same material that's used for public zoos and aquariums. So, I mean, this has been in service for, you know, a long time as ever aquariums have been around. Um, 
in the realize context. when you're talking aquarium, so a swimming pool is 34, 3,600 parts per million salt. When you get into an aquarium type situation, we're talking 20,000 to 30,000 parts per million. So massively different amount of salt conditions. So um, it, it, it performs pretty well in any, either of those operations, correct? Correct. Yeah. And, and, and what the point that you touched on, it is, it is very smooth. It's not porous. So you won't get as much calcium buildup, whether it's a static water line or if you're using it as a weir wall or anything like that. Um, you know, we just recommend a microfiber towel to wipe down that, that, that line. Um, you know, hard water stains and stuff, you won't get it to stick on there like you're experiencing or you mentioned with the water line tile. Okay. Talk a little bit, Jason, about um, using it as a weir wall, uh, because uh, with the thermal expansion, I have not done one yet uh, mm -hmm. as an infinity system. Um, but, uh, you know, especially in Arizona, where you may be 40 degrees in the morning and, and you know, upper 90s in the afternoon, um, some seasons talk about uh, how does it perform in that kind of a situation? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's kind of why we, we want to get involved early, right? So we, t we take a look at the high and lows of the temperatures, what type of thermal dynamic we're going to have, what the temperature loss is going to be. Um, so, for example, East Coast, where we've got a freeze and thaw scenario, you know, we're recommending that the clients are running their pool, you know, annually. Um, if they are going to run it, I ask them to maintain a temperature of at least 50 degrees. Um, the material will be able to take the freeze thaw. Um, I just don't want the pool block itself freezing. Um, it'll be able to move, but we don't want the ice actually, you know, pushing against that window causing the problem. Um, but yeah, we definitely get involved early. Um, we did a project down in Miami. The wall was 67 feet, uh, one piece. Uh, it was chemically fused together in the factory, but, you know, we had to manage that that movement. So we've got three inch caulk joints at the end of the window because that panel will expand and contract an inch to an inch and a half throughout the day. So uh, depending on what the temperatures are. So that's why, you know, like Rick kind of talked about the details and how, how critical it is for us to get involved with the rebate detail, what the engineering needs to look like. And again, for us to be able to design that, that sealant joint so we can accommodate for the movement. Well, and I, I so think to Dave's movement... point, there's a point Dave's trying to bring up. So when we're dealing with in, we've got a job that we're working on right now that Dave's aware of, we've got an acrylic panel, which is our negative edge. And we have a Lautner edge, which is, you know, porcelain tile or, or, or stone the client expectation needs to be understood and the hydraulic considerations need to be taken into place that that panel will change dimension. And on a panel that the picture I showed you of that 10 foot tall panel, we're going to get dynamically more change in that panel over of its height over time. than next to that panel on that same project is a one foot tall panel. So we're going to have a factor of 10 difference in some of the movement of that panel. And so on the hydraulic side, consideration wise, we want to be able to move quite a bit more water than we would normally plan for in a, in a perimeter overflow pool, because we're going to have change in temperature and change in time will move that. Now, ideally to Jason's point, you want the clients to keep those pan those temperatures of that water fairly consistent if you want to maintain that. Because if we take a 10 foot tall panel and run it in a pool that gets down to the mid forties in the winter, and then expect to be able to handle 90 to 190 degree water, 85 degree water in the summer and not have any kind of change in height, we're going to be wrong, right? So we, we, we can true the panel up to a point if there's any difference in, in setting situation, but the, the end result is, one, we want to try to true the panel up in the most natural configuration it's going to be in. If it's in a very arid or a nice climate like California, we don't get massive temperature changes on the, on the shore or near, near, the, near the ocean. If we get dynamic temperature differences, that edge could move a lot. And so we want to make sure we have a lot extra flow to manage the fact that we might need to overcome the fact that this thing just got taller on us and now we have to provide more water to it. So be very cautious um, how you do that. Lautner edges are very forgiving, right? So if we've got a Lautner edge pool, um, if we're not actually flowing water, someone might not even notice that we're not flowing water as long as it's crucibling right at the edge and we're flowing a lot of water over the negative edge. If we have a fixed negative edge out of concrete, like the job me and Jason did in Connecticut, and we have an acrylic panel that's also the negative edge, those two are going to be different at the same time. And so we've got to make sure we can speed up or move more water in the event that one of them is lower than the other so we can keep it all wet. So it's, it's a great question, Dave. You definitely have to manage and think differently through the hydraulic side. It's not so much the panel can't manage the situation. It's this that you need to make sure that you're not designing as if it's fixed with everything else. You got to realize that it might, it's not going to be a lot of movement, but it could be enough that we need to change the flow some overall so we can overcome it. Yeah. And Rick, I think on that 10 foot job you were just talking about in California, we've got, I think we've got it spec'd out as we're pushing three eighths of an inch or a half inch of water over that, over that big window. 
yeah. uh, just because of the volume itself, right? So that panel's 10 inches, plus it's mitered on the top to give it a little bit more of a, of a, of a weird effect. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to move a decent amount of water over that. And then plus the, you know, the volume from that side going down into the spillway. So um, that would have to be able to be adjustable for that, depending on how much if you're using the burial speed pump, how much water is moving over that edge. Right. And you want to make sure that, like I said, when you're truing up your panel, if it's like, say we're in Arizona, we get some real cold winters. You wouldn't want to be truing that panel up in height when it's 40 degrees out six days in a row, eight days in a row, because that panel is as small as it probably will ever be. And then we're going to put water in it and it's going to be at 85 the rest of the rest of its life. So just take into those considerations. And obviously it's a factor of height and, and panel size. And so really short panels are going to be, you know, a one foot panel is, is, is one tenth of what a 10 foot panel might do over expansion. So it's not always a huge impact but it certainly can be um, and it comes down to client expectations they need to know hey this panel will move a little bit so there might be a time of year where the dry or the rigid concrete or tile section of this pool doesn't flow as much water because the the, the glass acrylic panel is shorter um, or vice versa right so just make sure that the clients understand that and ideally you've accommodated enough water capacity and flow capacity from the get-go the last thing you want to do is say we need more water and have no ability to get it there so now's the time to put an extra extra suction size or extra suction lines, even extra pump, even if you don't use it, put it in now because if the last thing you want to be is short on water. Cool. Um, it, it, if Jabe, I don't know if we want, we can open it up quick for a short term, ask me anything kind of thing. If there's, we still got about 50 people watching and paying attention. Um, if you're watching and have some specific questions, you're welcome to jump in on the, on the uh, text or Q and a, um, we'll give you a minute or two to pop some questions in. We're happy to answer them. Um, short of that, I want to thank everybody for coming on. This is a, uh, one, of the, one of the future things we're going to continue to do in the future. We're going to take a couple of my projects and Dave's projects and, and some other um, members of our team and break them down and walk you through the construction. So uh, make sure you jump onto our YouTube channel, like and subscribe that. Make sure you're getting the new updates. Follow us on Facebook for sure. Um, you can also ask questions there. Hopefully they get answered by us and other experts that are involved. But this is, uh, this is one of the new formats we want to try. If you liked it, make sure we know. Send us, a, send us some comments on Facebook or the YouTube channel. This entire video will be uh, updated, edited, and put out to our YouTube channel here in a matter of weeks. Um, and if there's a project or a type of situation, we're going to do some shorter ones too where we're talking – you know, how to hydraulically design a, a small swimming pool or how to manage acrylic panel installation or how to, what's the best way to, to waterproof around penetrations. We're going to start doing some video shorts as well. So if there's items or concepts you guys are interested in us talking about or getting some experts involved on, man, reach out to us, let us know. We'd be happy to provide you and bring the experts in, in, in here to talk with us. So it's not just me and Dave babbling. Yeah, and it's not us figuring out what you guys want either. Um, you know, I mean, the, the Rick and I have gotten to the place where we are at uh, because we surrounded ourselves with people that taught us. Uh, and and by no means is it the fact that Rick and I are smart or anything like that. We have surrounded ourselves by experts. Um, uh, I think both of us are unique in that we're very willing to ask questions and very willing to put ourselves out there. Uh, and so we wanted to create this forum uh, for you guys uh, to be able to have a place where, uh, you know, it's a little easier to text in a question and then to actually walk up to somebody at a trade show. Uh, and so by all means, let us know um, what you guys want, what, what, is, what are the things that you want us to cover, and we will definitely grab them. No, you're muted, Rick. Somebody's asking for a YouTube link in the chat, so I'm finding that form so we can put that up. Yeah, why don't you, um, why don't you answer the questions? I'll grab that for you. Yeah. Somebody asked me which tile crew we used on this. So we, we have an in-house tile crew that we use on a lot of our projects. You've also probably seen that we've brought in Jimmy Reed or Alpen Tile on projects too. So um, we've got uh, three guys that work for us directly and do amazing tile work, but often we are either too busy or it's a project that's um, larger in scale where we need to bring in team and help. So um, to be honest, uh, we had two, we had two or three good tile guys that have been with us now for almost, almost 15 or 20 years. Um, they've had the benefit of, uh, imparting knowledge out of me but most most importantly they've been able to work alongside um, the likes of Jimmy Reed's crews and Alpentile's crews and learn from them and so they've done some amazing projects for us um, for ourselves but they've they've gained some extensive knowledge working with uh, those guys and then I you know we did 
we've, we've done some seminars too, where we've done, uh, we brought Latacrete in and, and, and Pebble or a uh, wet edge and worked together and went a bunch, went through a bunch of learning on their products. And we bring them to those kind of things. Um, you know, constant learning and constant uh, product knowledge is helpful. So, uh, anybody needs that it's, it's definitely available. You can get these guys to help out, but that's where we've gotten the experience. And Dave has, Dave has posted that YouTube channel for us. So um, it's out there. We've got a lot of videos on it. We've been trying to help with uh, business situations with the Paycheck Protection Program. And we're doing a lot of, uh, we do some interviews with, with uh, you know, icons in the industry. Um, we're going to spend more time in the future, though, as we go forward, doing more uh, interactive how-tos and, and, and more, more constructive on, on how things should be done or how at least how, we do, how we're doing them maybe and what we've had success with. Yeah, and just uh, just to reiterate, the YouTube is just youtube.com slash askthemasters. Um, so uh, for those of you that are not on the chat, maybe you're uh, maybe you're tuning in on your phone and that. Um, so it's just youtube.com slash askthemasters. And we'd be glad to have you. Yep, looks like we've gotten through all of the questions. So um, yeah, I, I just... Um, like I said at the beginning of this, uh, there's as much for me here um, uh, as as all of you, uh, and I picked up a number of things. I've got some notes here uh, that I took from this. So, thanks so much, Rick, for doing this. Um, and uh, Jason and Art, you know, it's always it's always a pleasure to bring in the people and the experts behind the scenes uh, that that uh, that help us with the products and that that make these projects be able to to come to reality. So, thank you both so much for for being on here and bringing your expertise as well. Well, thank you for having us. We, I learned a lot. This was awesome. Thank you awesome. so much for having us. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I'm, I'm happy, obviously, working with you guys. You guys tend to push the, the boundaries of what most people are doing, uh, kind of expand the envelope and, and, you know, be cutting edge with a lot of the stuff that's going on. So, um, you know, anything we can do on the, on the front end for the design work to help everybody or, you know, don't, don't think that any question is, uh, is a bad question. So let's, you know, anything we could do to help out. Yeah, and most of you guys are, a lot of you guys probably see us on our Facebook site too. We've got the Facebook side gets a ton of interactions and, and guys like Art and Jason are on there. So um, if you've got more questions that we didn't properly answer or you, or you want some, uh, you want some, or you thought of something after this webinar, feel free to put something up there. We'll, we'll reach out to them. We tag them when we see those kind of things where we try to answer them ourselves. So hopefully this was uh, very beneficial for everybody. I'm hoping we gave you uh, some good pieces. So give us some feedback on either our Facebook or YouTube channel, or just reach out to us directly. Um, if you go to um, our, our Facebook channel, you can, you can direct message me or Dave and we can get some good feedback from you. All right, perfect. Uh, I think we've gotten through all of the questions. So um, if nobody else has anything else, I think we're gonna sign off. Peace.